This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Is tech cracking? The sector has led the market higher. If it starts to falter, what happens to the bull run? Trade deal. The White House reaches an agreement with South Korea. And at the center of it, the automakers. Riding in style. Why a luxury sedan just doesn't cut it anymore. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Wednesday, March the 28th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Tech is struggling. It was evident today again as the sector fell again. One of the biggest decliners was Amazon. Shares were down more than 4 percent, wiping billions off its market value on reports that the president wants to rein in its power and change the way the company is taxed. The White House, though, says it's not considering any specific policy. And then there is Apple. Goldman Sachs cut sales estimates for the iPhone, which is Apple's flagship product. The Dow component is also facing multiple lawsuits over its controversial move to slow older smartphones. And for a change, shares of Facebook were higher after that company redesigned some of its security settings. Well, whatever, the decline in tech did weigh on the broader market again today, although the losses were modest this time. Here are the numbers. The Dow dropped by nine points. That was it, to 23,848. The Nasdaq was the biggest percentage decliner. It was down by 59 points. The S&P fell by seven. As you know, the tech sector has been powering the broader market higher over the past year or so. It's a widely owned sector over this past two weeks and has lost half a trillion dollars in value. And so now some are questioning whether tech's dominant position in the market is over. Bob Pisani explains. The market's tone has shifted. Just two weeks ago, it was all about tariffs and trade wars. Now there's new uncertainty around technology and what effect that might have on earnings. Facebook's data scandal has thrown social media into an existential crisis. Then you've got NVIDIA's driverless car issues and Tesla's credit downgrade. Apple's getting hit after Goldman cut iPhone sales estimates this year. And now there's word that President Donald Trump might go after Amazon's tax treatment. Here's the problem. Technology has gotten way too big for its britches. It's so big that as tech goes, so goes the S&P 500. And that's risky. The three biggest stocks in the S&P 500 are Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet. Combined, they have a market cap of about $2.3 trillion out of the S&P's market cap of about $23 trillion. So three stocks make up 10% of the S&P 500. Tech is 25% of the S&P in total. Add financials into the equation, and those two groups make up about 40% of the S&P. That's a lot. Meanwhile, the smallest sectors, energy, materials, utilities, telecom, real estate, they're only 15%. They don't matter that much. So what does matter is the swing groups, healthcare, industrials, consumer discretionary, consumer staple stocks. They make up 45%, all the rest of the S&P. So if tech and financials falter, these are the only ones left with the heft needed to move the needle. You see the problem? So those are the ones investors will try to rotate into, providing the market is healthy and earnings are rising in those sectors. But tech and financials are supposed to see the biggest earnings growth this year. That's why the market is so vulnerable to a sell-off when the earnings quality of its largest group, technology, gets called into question. You see the issue? It's a very tough situation right now. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. So let's turn now to Chris Zaccarelli for more on the weakness in the tech sector and what it might mean for the bull market. He is the chief investment officer at the wealth management firm Independent Advisor Alliance. Nice to see you, Chris. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I think Bob set it up for us perfectly about the risks that are in the market with tech. But you also make the point that you think we're at a bit of a turning point or an inflection point for this particular part of the market. I do, and, and I think Bob has it exactly right, it, because tech's 25% of the market. As, you know, as tech goes, so goes the rest of the market. It's going to be leading the market either upward or downward. Right now, we've been seeing tech have some weakness, and that's taking us down. But if, if things can turn around in the next few weeks as we start earnings season and start to see technology earnings, if they're strong again, I think that could provide some support for technology and therefore for the rest of the market. But we've been asking some other money managers who they feel could lead higher if technology doesn't do that. Some have said financials as the Fed raises rates. That's good for the financials. Others say that tariffs won't bother the small to mid cap stocks out there. Who do you vote for? Uh, I'm in favor of financials. I like the setup for financials in terms of fundamental reasons. If you look at rising interest rates, 
if you look at uh, the credit quality of loans out there, because we've got low unemployment and people are able to pay back those loans, and if you and if you look at the strength of the underlying economy, as the economy continues to grow, you see more economic activity. That's typically followed by more banking activity, whether that's mergers and acquisitions or just more loans. So in general, the fundamentals are really good for for financials. If sentiment can turn around and some of the pessimism that's the market that we've been seeing in the last few weeks were to change because of either positive earnings reports or some of the, the fears blow over, we could really see a turning point. That's really the, the catalyst that could, could turn things around. And what about earnings? Because as Bob highlighted, not just for technology, but for many parts of the market, the expectations are pretty high. I think that's true. Earnings expectations have been rising, but keep in mind those tax cuts are going to drop a lot to the bottom line. So if you see earnings expectations rising about 6%, but yet uh, tax cuts, if you uh, filter through all the earnings estimates, would lead to an additional 8%, which is what a lot of analysts believe, mm. you actually may have some, some room there to actually surprise the upside, even with those heightened expectations. Let's go back to tech then as we wrap this up here. Do you think it's a pause or could it move higher? And who would you look at to uh, maybe invest in here? Sure. I think right now we're going to go sideways. I think until we see some positive catalyst, most likely to be earnings, you're going to have a lot of concerns over the market. And it's, it's a sell first, ask questions later type of market. If you look within technology, I think the semiconductors have been hit. You've got the uh, social media companies have been hit. And you look at the hardware companies, they've all been hit. Looking through all of those, I think where you're, you're most likely to see a rebound will be in that semiconductor area. The reason I say that is because that's such a part of all of the different themes that are, that are in technology, whether that's cloud computing, increased need for storage, um, self-driving cars, to the extent that, that they can rebound from some of the, the, news, the negative news headlines they've had lately. That's the area of the market within, techno within technology I would look for as a bellwether and also to invest in. Chris, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Chris Zaccarelli with Appreciate Independent you, Advisor Alliance. To the economy now, which saw growth in the fourth quarter revised higher. According to the Commerce Department, GDP, the broadest measure of the economy, grew by 2.9 percent in the final three months of last year. That was more than expected. Growth was helped by the biggest gain in consumer spending in three years, and that offset a drag from trade, which saw a rise in imports. The number of homes that went under contract rebounded last month. Pending home sales were up 3.1 percent after falling in January. The National Association of Realtors blames the uneven performance on a shortage of houses for sale. The agency says that will likely cause 2018 to be a challenging year. It expects sales to be flat from a year ago. The White House has inked its first significant trade deal. In this case, it's with South Korea. It's a one-on-one -on -one agreement that some say could represent a blueprint for other deals. Kayla Tausche reports from Washington for us tonight. President Trump notched a trade win, touting a new deal with South Korea to replace a six-year-old agreement he spent the last year criticizing. The deal we have with South Korea is a very one-sided deal. It's a deal that has to be changed. The goal, to lower the U.S. trade deficit with Korea, which stood at $10 billion in 2017. The bulk of the imbalance? Automobiles. U.S. car companies could only sell 25,000 cars each into Korea before, a limit they didn't come close to meeting. The New Deal doubles that limit, which Ambassador Robert Lighthizer says should spur more business. We think we're going to make real improvements. It's not going to go to 50,000 per manufacturer immediately, but I think it's going to get way above 25, and I think we're talking in the not-too-distant future about billions of dollars of additional sales. And I would say that, that, that that, that other countries do sell in there, and we have the kind of products that they'll buy. The White House says there are new cuts to regulation in Korea and a side deal combating currency manipulation, as well as new caps on how much steel Korea can send to the U.S. That's in place of recently announced tariffs. Despite being close allies, trade talks were contentious when they started, with President Trump surprising South Korea's new president by publicly slamming the deal during their first meeting. Our trade deficit with South Korea has increased by more than $11 billion. Not exactly a great deal. And then threatening to withdraw altogether. Today, Trump tweeting the two countries can now focus on their security relationship as a summit between the U.S. and North Korea nears. I think there's a political reason behind this as well. 
as, as President Trump thinks about his meeting with Kim Jong-un at the end of May and reflecting on what's just happened, this surprise visit by Kim to Beijing, South Korea and the United States could not afford to be in a trade fight with this big strategic event ahead of us. And I think that's probably another rationale for what happened over the last 24 hours. The White House says preparations are still underway for that meeting, with nothing set in stone. Meanwhile, another major trade event looms. That's the renegotiation of NAFTA. Foreign officials say the U.S. has not set the date of the next round of talks, which is supposed to take place in Washington in April. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche at the White House. As Kayla just reported, that trade deal comes as North Korea's leader met with China's president. Eunice Yoon picks up the story for us from Beijing. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un traveled to Beijing to meet with China's President Xi Jinping, but he had a message for President Trump. According to Chinese state media, Kim told Xi that Pyongyang is willing to start a dialogue with the U.S., agreeable to hold a North Korea-U.S. summit, and committed to denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. The Chinese government-run Xinhua News Agency also quoted Kim as saying the issue of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula can be resolved if South Korea and the United States respond to our efforts with good will. The timing is extremely important. Kim is scheduled to hold a summit with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in in late April, and there's a possibility that he'll be meeting with President Trump soon after that. So analysts here believe that this visit was meant to prepare for those meetings and also to get support from Chinese officials who've traditionally been his closest allies. North Korea watchers believe that the relations between China and North Korea have come under strain because Beijing has been more strictly adhering to U.S. And sanctions. And today, though, the official papers were full of praise of the relationship, calling it a sign that the ties are unshakable. This visit was unofficial, but it had the same pomp and circumstance as for any other foreign leader, including a banquet at the Great Hall of the People. This was Kim's first trip outside of North Korea since he took power in 2011. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Beijing. Time to take a look now at uh, some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Dow component Verizon saw its rating raised to a buy from hold over at HSBC. The firm says that Verizon is well positioned in the Internet media space. That could help its revenue grow. Price target, $55. That stock rose about 1.5% today to 48 even. And coverage of fellow Dow component American Express was initiated with a buy rating at UBS. The firm says that accelerating business volume and loan growth could drive revenue there, and in turn, that could result in stronger earnings per share. Price target they put in, $111. The stock rose fractionally to $92.21. In that same note, the UBS analyst started coverage of Discover Financial with a sell rating. The firm cites potential erosion of asset and revenue growth. The price target is now $70 a share. The stock was up slightly nonetheless to $70.28. And Bernstein initiated coverage of the Dow component Visa with an outperform rating. The analyst calls Visa's business model attractive and says it should benefit from the growing payments market. The price target there is $143 a share. The stock fell a fraction to $116.99. Still ahead, some of the brightest minds in healthcare together in one place discussing one of the most complex industries in the world. Japan's largest drug maker is considering a possible bid for Irish biotech company Shire. Price tag could top $40 billion. Takeda Pharmaceuticals said that everything is still very preliminary right now and that no approach has actually been made to Shire's board. Shire sells treatments for rare diseases and hyperactivity disorders, and Takeda believes that a combination with Shire would strengthen its position here in the U.S. Shares of Shire rose on that news by 12% to 144.53. 
Health insurance startup Oscar Health raised $165 million in a new round of funding. The company said that money will help accelerate its expansion that includes moving into four or five new cities every year. Oscar offers individual and small group health insurance policies and has grown its affordable health care offerings this year to more states. The changing health care industry was the focus of CNBC's Healthy Returns Conference that brought innovators, investors and business leaders together to discuss new solutions to some very complex problems. Meg Terrell has more from New York. 13-year-old Paige Wharton has already been through more than most adults. That was very depressing for me because like, like, no, this is real. They're like, it could just be in your head. We're not saying it's not real. We think you're creating it. And I'm like, I think I know if I'm creating it. She had a pain in her joints that got worse and worse over the years. It took an odyssey of testing to finally discover what was wrong. Paige has a rare genetic disease. She shared her story on stage at CNBC's Healthy Returns Conference today in New York, where she was joined by people working across healthcare, from industry to government to Wall Street. FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb kicked off the day talking about the agency's efforts to lower drug prices through increasing competition. He also focused on the agency's work in public health. But I think the most important thing that we can do is get back to public health basics, reduce smoking rates, promote healthy diets, promote vaccination rates. If we could actually make significant progress on those three things, the public health gains would dwarf any single invention that we can come up with. Other topics on display at the conference were the Amazon effect on health care, cutting edge technologies like gene editing and the use of big data, and of course the changing face of the industry through massive consolidation. As for Paige, she was lucky there is a treatment for her condition, but she still lives with the pain every day. I'm still getting a lot of pain, but the treatment isn't supposed to take pain away. It's supposed to prevent it from getting worse. And it has done that? It's no worse than it was? It is no worse than it was. Something for medicine to keep working on. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell in New York City. A strong pharmacy business helps Walgreens results. That's where we begin tonight's market focus. Walgreens posted results that topped analysts' expectations as that company filled more prescriptions for more expensive specialty drugs. Same-store sales in its retail business continued to be pressured, though, as customers increasingly shift their buying habits online. Walgreens also hiked its full-year earnings forecast. The shares rose 2.5% to 67.59. The credit monitoring company Equifax named former General Electric executive Mark Begor as its new CEO. In September, Equifax's former chief executive, Richard Smith, stepped down following a data breach at that company that compromised the personal information of nearly 150 million Americans. As new chief executive, Begor said that he plans to prioritize efforts to win back customers' trust. Equifax was up more than 2 percent to 119.04. And growth in BlackBerry's software and services business helped sales beat estimates, and it led to a smaller quarterly loss. The company has shifted its focus from hardware to software and licensing. BlackBerry said the strategy is working, and it's optimistic about future performance. We're done with the turnaround, so to speak, and we got a really good business here, showing a couple of good uh, quarters we saw. I think three uh, have a good uh, fiscal 18, so very happy with it. We're ready, we're ready to tackle it. Shares fell 20 cents to $12.20. Bill? Sue, elsewhere, defense contractor Khaki International has withdrawn its $7 billion offer for CSRA, effectively ending its bidding war with rival General Dynamics. Last week, recall, we told you that General Dynamics had raised its all-cash offer for the information technology company in an effort to compete with Khaki's bid. Khaki and GD were both lower today while CSRA was unchanged in today's session. And after the bell tonight, GameStop reported a rise in revenue and same-store sales thanks to strong demand for Nintendo's Switch game console. Earnings were also ahead of expectations. Shares of the video game retailer were up 2% to 1415. And clothing company PVH also topped earnings expectations after the bell tonight thanks to strength in its Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger brands. PVH expects that momentum to continue. It gave an upbeat outlook for the entire year as a result. Shares were initially higher following the news after hours and ended the regular session today up a fraction at 144.02.
Coming up, the big demand for bigger cars. Luxury autos are hot, but right now buyers want more than just another luxury sedan. What are they looking for? I'm Phil LeBeau at the New York International Auto Show. I'll tell you when Nightly Business Report returns. Moody's lowered its credit rating on Tesla by one notch late yesterday. The credit rating agency cites the company's large negative free cash flow and the shortfall in production of its Model 3 electric car. Tesla is also under scrutiny by the National Transportation Safety Board, which is conducting an investigation into a fatal crash in California. The stock dropped 7 percent to 257.78. Federal regulators want to cancel a planned increase in higher penalties for gas-guzzling vehicles. The rule was put into place by the Obama administration. It called for a doubling of fines if cars fail to meet minimum fuel economy standards. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says that a higher penalty would have a negative economic impact. Not surprisingly, automakers had opposed that increase, saying it could raise compliance costs by $1 billion annually. Trucker pay is rising. A recent study by the American Trucking Association showed the median salary increased about 15 percent to $53,000 from 2013 to 2017. By comparison, average hourly earnings for all private workers rose about 10 percent during the same period of time. The trucking industry, as we've been reporting, is facing a shortage of drivers and increased demand for shipping services. For years now, the New York Auto Show has been the place to see the latest luxury cars. But this year, the luxury lines are pushing new SUVs and crossovers, which now make up a majority of the sales among the high-end models. Phil LeBeau has our story from the Big Apple tonight. From the return of the Lincoln Aviator, to BMW's redesigned X4, to Cadillac's new X-T4, automakers are pushing luxury SUVs harder than ever. The XT4 puts us into the heart of one of the hottest growing segments uh, in the U.S. market, and it's a very compelling entry, and I think Cadillac is going to take a large share of that business. Cadillac and other luxury auto brands are cashing in on America's growing appetite for bigger vehicles. What started over a decade ago with mass market brands offering a wider variety of crossovers and SUVs has now extended to the luxury players who are capitalizing on wealthier buyers who want to sit higher in a more refined interior. The demand for high-end SUVs is so strong, BMW's plant in South Carolina, which only builds SUVs, is expanding production. So we feel in a very strong position. We've got Spartanburg here. We produce it. The biggest factory we have globally. We export about 70 percent. We sell about 30 percent here in the U.S. and NAFTA. And I have to say, we feel in a very, very good position. Right now, over 60 percent of the vehicles sold in the United States are trucks and SUVs. But that percentage is even higher among some luxury brands, like Lexus. In Lexus's case, it's almost 70 percent luxury SUVs. In fact, uh, in New York, we're launching another new one, the UX, which is just below NX. So, so I think we've got a great portfolio and a great SUV to offer any customer. With gas prices expected to remain relatively low, demand for bigger, less fuel efficient vehicles should remain robust and even a little stronger among luxury names. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, New York. And from cars to boats, Business has been growing thanks to the rising stock market and the strengthening economy. But at the recent Miami Boat Show, experts say the industry could be starting to face some waves. Landon Dowdy has more. The Miami International Boat Show attracts marine enthusiasts from around the world for a sneak peek at the industry's latest innovations. And this year, a rising tide is lifting all boats. Yacht sales and, and all boat sales are being driven by, again, the uh, consumer confidence, the wealth effect. Uh, people just feel good today. The industry is entering its seventh straight year of growth, and though growth in the number of boats sold annually is actually slowing, the average cost of a new vessel is on the rise. Consumers are opting for bigger boats and higher horsepower outboards. 
This Brunswick 38 foot Boston Whaler yacht retails for almost a million dollars. It comes fully loaded with new smart boat features, allowing boat owners to monitor things like battery charge and oil levels remotely, plus autonomous driving technology to help with navigation at sea. And docking ashore. Nailed it. Nailed it. Those in the market for a boat or a yacht watched the stock market closely, and there may have been some concern with the recent market volatility, but it wasn't enough to turn people away. Technology is something that excites people and says, I really got to get one of those. And it's not all about giant yachts. Torquedo's electric outboards, powered by solar panels on the dock, offer sustainability. And for surfers in search of the perfect wave, Malibu's patented technology lets riders build that wake with just the tap of a wrist. Still, the industry is facing some headwinds, like millennials' preference for renting over buying, fueling the rise of boat sharing and boat clubs, and the recent memory of last year's devastating storms. Our business um, uh, really soared after the hurricanes that hit the west coast of Florida here uh, and, and the other areas of the country. What's more frustrating than worrying about your assets sitting in the water when you have a hurricane bearing down on it? But for some shipless captains, the lure of the open ocean will prove too much. Following Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy, the industry benefited from consumers replacing and upgrading damaged property. Boat builders, dealers, and marine industry analysts say they expect insurance payouts for hurricane damaged boats to provide some extra wind in 2018 sales. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Landon Dowdy in Miami. And before we go, one other look at the day on Wall Street. A much calmer session today than we saw Monday or Tuesday. The Dow dropped just by nine points. The Nasdaq was down 59. The S&P down seven. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.